back. We were gone for about uh, a week, a little over a week, um, traveling almost 5,000 miles in a barge on wheels <laughs> in, our, uh, in our mobile home. And I'm telling you, there's not a whole lot that's comfortable about it. It's noisy and shakes, and uh, it was windy, and we didn't pick a very good time of year to do this, honey. You know, you don't travel up north in the winter time. We had to uh, we had to change our route because they were expecting a snowstorm in northern Colorado, so we had to go. I think it was four hours out of the way to avoid that. We still ended up running into snow in uh, even southern Colorado, but it uh, it was an interesting trip. But we visited. Uh, visited our, our, our second son and uh, our eldest son. We were actually together for Thanksgiving, which was really nice, and they're both back here. Uh, Ethan came back with us, and uh, Stefan surprised us a couple days ago. We had no idea he was coming home. He lied to us. <laughs> he said he's not coming home. To, I think he lied to you, too, didn't he? Yeah. Lied to the whole family, said he wasn't going to come home. Forgiven. Yeah, but it's forgiven. It's washed under the blood. No, it's, it's good to have my family together for the holidays. I know my mother loves that, and, uh, and I know that you love that, having, having your family together, especially your kids that have gone away, and they have them back home during the holidays. There's just, there's just nothing like it. Just let me begin and um, open in prayer before I get into the message this morning. Father, we just thank you for your word, your truth, Lord, which, which we need. Without you and without your word, we have no direction. We're lost, but you found us. And because we're, we're found, um, we have confidence, we have trust, we have hope in you. We have hope for a future because, Lord, we are in you and you are in us. And uh, so, Lord, we just give you this morning, I pray, Father, that this word this morning would, again, transform hearts and minds because it's your word, it's your truth. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for being with us and, uh, and walking among us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, how many of you like to read the Bible? Raise your hand. How many like to pray? Raise your hand. All right. How many like to sing worship songs? How many of you like to fast? Yeah, it was, it's a lot less. If you're, if you're from my vantage point, it, it's literally about 70% less. And I think the people that raise their hand are actually lying. There's this lying thing going on. <laughs> fasting. We're fasting. Luckily, we, we're only doing it for two weeks instead of 21 days. Um, <laughs> I don't like fasting. I, I, I got to admit it. I don't like fasting. And, uh, and I think most of you would say, no, I don't like fasting. You know, fa you know what fasting is like to me? It, it, it's like, fasting's like a splinter. I have a splinter in my foot. I know the splinter needs to come out. It's going to be good if the splinter comes out, but it's going to be painful picking it out. That's, that's what fasting is like to me. Now, there are incredible benefits to fasting. God encourages us to fast. He never commanded us. He encourages us to do it. Actually, there was kind of an assumption in the New Testament that, that, that his disciples fast. And fasting was part of that culture. So I know the benefits of fasting. And I can tell you, some of my most incredible experiences with the Lord had been fasting. But it's misery a lot of the time. And uh, especially if you, you, you stay away from certain foods that you love. <laughs> So, if, if you don't have the power within you to fast food, you can fast other things. Someone came up to me and said, I'm going to fast sin. <laughs> no, that's something you're supposed to be staying away from all the time. <laughs> so, if, if, if you sin a lot, fast sin. That's great. But, you know, you can fast other things. You can fast uh, social media. That'd be a great thing. Uh, kids, teenagers, fast your cell phones. That's going to be comical, trying to see them stay away from their cell phones. But, I mean, you can, you can pick things to stay away from. But it's not about, it's really not about what you're removing. It's about, it's about what you're adding. And uh, this is not a teaching on fasting, but I want to tell you, someone who's, who's practiced, practiced fasting, um, a more extended 
period during this time of the year, you know, for, for many years, it has incredible benefits. And I'm telling you, if you're looking for an answer from the Lord, you will hear from him. You'll hear from him. You'll, you'll have an intimacy that you, that you hadn't had in a long time. If this is your first time fasting and you get over the misery of, you know, the, the, staying away from food or whatever, I'm telling you, God will bless you. He will, he will honor that. All right, so I encourage you to, uh, to participate in your bulletin. There's, uh, there's some scripture readings. Um, the message is not about that today, but it's interesting. The scripture readings touch on what I want to share this morning. All right, if you pull out of your bulletin the 14-day fast schedule, today there's, uh, there's a few different passages, one from the Old Testament in Genesis 1, 26 through 31, and then in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 10, and 5 through 17. All of these scriptures, just to, just to kind of sum them up, Genesis basically talks about how God gave us dominion over the earth. He gave us dominion. He gave us authority, and, and uh, that authority is still in the hands of believers. We need, to, we need to take back what the enemy has stolen. Take back what the locust has, locust has stolen. In Corinthians, it talks about us being earthen vessels and that we are, we are God's glory. And we manifest his glory and manifest his ways. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.17, something represented, represented by us taking communion today, that cup represented the new covenant. We're part of a new covenant. We're part of a different kingdom. When we become a believer, we are now set on a course to abide by kingdom law. And for me, kingdom law is more important than any other law in the land. Kingdom law applies first. And oftentimes, kingdom law might contradict something that you're experiencing or other laws. Now, thank, I'm, I'm thankful that we live in a country that very much mirrors biblical laws. It seems like that line is blurring a little bit, but we're fortunate to be in a country that was, that was modeled after biblical, biblical laws. And um, what I want to share with you today is, I think, one of the most important kingdom principles. I think that if you can't understand this principle, you won't understand any other principle. As a matter of fact, Jesus in his parable um, many of his parables communicated the same principle over and over again, and he told his disciples, if you don't understand this, then you won't understand the kingdom. And that is the principle, and I hesitate to call it a principle because it's more than that, but it's the principle of sowing and reaping. It is more than a principle. It is a law. It's an irrevocable law that, that has its effects on every man that walks the earth. Not just believers, but unbelievers also. But for us as believers, it's very important to understand sowing and reaping because it touches every area of our life. And I know sometimes when people talk about sowing and reaping, they're talking about giving finances. I'm barely going to talk about that this morning. I might touch on it because it, it mentions it in the first passage of Scripture we're going through, but that's just a small part of understanding the law of sowing and reaping. Spiritual laws mirror natural laws. We have natural laws that we just, we know are just are going to be true. If you, if you go to the top of the building and you drop something off the top of the building, it's going to fall down. You know, there's laws of gravity. There's laws of thermodynamics. There's, there's uh, laws, of, laws of motion. I mean, we understand those laws, and those are, we just accept those as this is just the way it is. Spiritual laws are the same thing, particularly this spiritual law. It's just the way it is. It's irrevocable, which basically means that's just the way it is. It's not going to change. And it applies to all of us. And I think that if we gain a better understanding of what sowing and reaping is, we'll learn to live lives that are victorious. Now, what my father said up here about communion is important. It's important to understand. And I think many people walk in condemnation, but there's the rest of the story. There's nothing that will separate you from the love of Christ, but there are things that will separate you from the intimacy that you have with Christ and from living a victorious life. God has a job for every believer to do. And unless we understand the principle of sowing and reaping and we understand that we have to renew our mind and we have to walk in purity, we will never know 
the level of intimacy that we can have with the Lord and we'll never know what he set us on this earth to do as individuals. Nobody hears a mistake. God has a plan for you. And part of that plan is to understand this, this law of sowing and reaping. It's a foundational um, kingdom principle. So I'm going to read uh, parts of a passage of scripture just for the sake of time. I'm not going to read it all. But the first is in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. If you want to turn there, you can, or it'll be up here on the screen. I'm going to start with verse 6. It says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. I'm going to skip down to verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower, he, as in the Lord, supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saint, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. And I'm going to stop there. You can read the rest of that on your own time. There's another passage I just want to touch on. It's in Galatians 6, 7. And I'm going to draw four principles out of these two passages of Scripture. Galatians 6, 7 is this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man, not just a believer, but whatever a man sows, he also shall not reap. You might have heard this quote before. Today is the father of tomorrow. What you do today, what we do today, in a sense, determines the course of tomorrow. What you think today will manifest in certain actions, maybe not just tomorrow, but in the next moment. The Lord gives principles in Scripture to serve as warnings of encouragement. And this one in Galatians 6, 7 is one of those. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this, shall, this, this he shall reap. I mean, you know from your life and other people's lives that you read about or that you watch, maybe they're, they're part of your family, that the certain things that they sow reap fruit. It reaps fruit. Sometimes that fruit's not pretty. Sometimes it's stinky. Sometimes it's rotten. Some, and oftentimes, hopefully, it's good. But whatever we sow, that is the sort of fruit that we're going to reap. And there's nothing sadder than to watch somebody ruin their lives by continuing to make, make the same mistake over and over and over again. Because it generally leads to a path of destruction, or at least disappointment. And I see it all the time. I've seen, I've seen it in my life. And I've recognized that that it's very important, the seeds that I sow into my heart or into my life or into my mind or, or in the, the seeds that I sow through my words and through my actions. And I have seen how my actions at times and my words at times have sowed things that I would rather not exist. But there is that irrevocable truth that what we sow, we shall reap. And that goes for believers too. Now there is grace Thank God for grace. That means God's not standing up there and every time you mess up, throwing down curses and you know, making all sorts of terrible things happen. I, matter of fact, I think he does the opposite for believers. That when we, that when we mess up on occasion, you know, he's like, I love you. I know that's not in your heart to do. You know, we're just going to let that one go. You ever do that as a parent with your kids? I know that I have done that. I could be relentless about certain things, and I've had to learn because that's one of my things. It's not a good thing. I can be relentless about certain things, and I would have to practice not being so relentless to the verge of harassing my kids. You know, I just had to, like, ignore certain things that I thought were unacceptable. You know, it's, it's important for us to do that. We have to understand that every word, every action produces a certain fruit. All right? So here's the four principles that I drew from these passages of Scripture. One, 
This, this law of sowing and reaping is a natural law and it's a spiritual law. It has ramifications in the natural world. Those are the things that you read on the news. Certain people do a certain thing and a certain thing happens. Uh, there, there are some people that have done certain things for a long period of time. And then it just so happens their kids do that same certain thing for a long period of time because those are the seeds that they have sown. It's also part of the spiritual world. This passage of scripture applies to both. So it applies to both Christians and non-Christians. And as I said before, it's irrevocable. You're not able to change it. This is why it's so important for us to recognize it. We can't assume as believers that we can act like unbelievers and it not have an effect on us and the people around us. That's the other side of the story. This is important. There's no condemnation in Christ. And sin doesn't separate us from the love of God. But I can tell you what, a lot of things that we do and a lot of things that we say certainly hinder intimacy with the Lord. And again, we've been set on the third earth to accomplish a certain task, and I can guarantee your destiny as a believer can be thwarted if you don't understand this, if you don't understand how important it is to sow good seed. Amen? That passage of Scripture in Galatians says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Herein lies the root cause of a careless lifestyle of many people. They are deceived. They, they, they either don't believe or they ignore the truth. Non-believers don't believe. Believers believe, they see the truth, but sometimes they ignore the truth because they just want to live their own way because it feels good. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That is the other side of the story to this, or the, or the, the rest of the story to this. You know, I don't want to just make it to heaven. I want to hear the words from the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you? Not, you made it by the skin of your teeth. It's awesome, I'm glad you made it. But what did you do? What did you do with the gifts that I've given you? What did you do with the truth that I gave you? I saved you, but I saved you not just so you can make it to heaven. I saved you so that you can save others. So that you can live a productive and victorious life. So that you can expand my kingdom. So one day, we'll all stand before the Lord. And we'll have to, we'll have to answer to him. What have we done? What have we done with the things that he's given us? The gifts that he's given us? If we're required to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, in the next few minutes, what kind of crops would you show him? You know, I've, I've lived a life at times where there's stuff that's hidden. You know, I've been, been in the church for a long time. I grew up in the church. There's certain things that I didn't want anybody else to know about. But God knew about those things. You can't hide those things from God. And it affects your relationship. And it, it affects living a victorious life. And God wants you to live a productive life. He wants you to be able to sow good seed. He wants to, he, the seed that he's sown in you, he wants it to bear good fruit. But we can't hinder that from happening, and we can. The second principle is this. We reap what we sow. And it means we can reap blessing, or in a sense, reap cursing. And I use that word a little bit loosely, I think it's more cause and effect. You know, I was explaining to a young person who was struggling with something. It's like God's created this garden, kind of like the Garden of Eden, this beautiful place that we can dwell with him and we're protected by him. But outside that fence, there's wolves. Now, he loves us. He's not going to chain us and make us stay in the garden. So he's going to let us roam freely. If we choose to hop over that fence, then we could get mauled or we could get bitten. That applies to believers too. Now I know there's grace and God is gracious. Trust me, there are plenty of things that I've done that I deserved a good slap, I, I deserved a good rebuke, or you know, I deserved a, a good yelling at from the Lord and he didn't do it because he's gracious and that's what grace is. But that does not mean that we can't climb over that fence 
and get bitten. It's important to stay within the protection of the Lord and in the blessing of the Lord. You can walk out of the blessing of the Lord. We cannot sow weeds and expect to reap apples. There's something peculiar I've noticed, and I, and I didn't get the name of what these weeds were, maybe because they only grow in my yard. <laughs> I'm telling you, there are certain trees and plants that I have planted in my yard, and no lie, underneath those very trees and in those very plants in the ground cover are weeds that look exactly like them. It's the most bizarre thing. I have this, they call it a twisty, twisty baby. It's a type, of, um, a type of elm tree. And I'm telling you, a weed grows with thorns on it that has, it's twisted, it has bark on it, and it looks exact. I'm thinking, oh, cool. I'm going to grow another tree. And I go and I look at it and tend it, and I get pricked. It's got, it's got thorns on it. I'm like, what the heck is this? And it's, it's starting, and it's not coming from the tree. It's this weird weed that's growing underneath the tree. The same thing with my ground cover. You can't, now I planted a tree, and it grew a tree. It, it grew what I expected. But, I don't know, somebody sowed a weed underneath that tree and underneath that weed. But generally, if you sow weeds, what are you going to get? Weeds. If you plant a cucumber seed or a plant, you're probably going to get a cucumber, right? You can expect to get that. If, if you need a good visual of, of the principle or, or, or the law of sowing and reaping, that's a good one. If you plant that type of seed or a particular type of seed, you can expect to get that particular type of fruit. That's encouraging to me. That's exciting to me. Because that, that says God's paying attention. It's like, it's like, God, I want to work for you. I'm, I'm doing good work for you. I, I know, I know. That's why you're experiencing certain blessing. But then there's the other side of that coin, that if we don't sow good seed, that we're going to experience the effect of that. And I've, 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 I've been there. And I know many believers that are there now, and we don't have to live like that. But we have to understand that this is, this is a law, and that grace doesn't remove this law. Grace is there. That's wonderful. Grace empowers us to live a godly and a righteous life. But grace doesn't remove the effects of bad decisions and wrong decisions and unhealthy decisions in our lives. If you sow righteousness, forgiveness, love, patience, generosity, maybe not right away, but most often right away, you get that in return. If you're patient with the people in your life, I bet you they're going to be patient with you. If you're impatient with the people in your life, they're probably going to be very impatient with you. You yell at somebody all the time. They may not yell at you, but they're going to recoil when you come into the room. They're not going to talk to you because those are the seeds that you're sowing. You understand? It'll have that effect. If you sow to your base nature, that's what you're going to reap. And this is a warning. It's a warning for all of this. Don't worry, I'm going to leave you encouraged. But it's... <laughs> It's a warning to all of us as believers. We can't live the way we want to live. And even as believers, I know there's temptations there. It's like easy to fall back into that old nature because our mind still needs to be renewed and we believe a lie. And those are the seeds that Satan has sown into our mind. And some of us, some of us have that going in our mind all the time because the stuff we watch or engage in, the conversations that we have, it's like you are watering the seed that Satan has put in your mind by the things that you're involved in. And I can tell you, the word promises that, that, that there will be an effect, that you will reap what you sow. Sometimes it's not, not right away, and I think that's God's grace. Even with non-believers, I know it's God's grace. God doesn't will anybody dies. He wants to save everyone. But there, there's, there's a point where, not that God gets frustrated, but he knows that, listen, they're going to have to experience some pain. They're going to have to experience some disappointment. Because, because I, I've, I've shared the truth with them. i put people around them that, that are trying to give them wisdom and, and guide them, but they're ignoring it. So they're going to have to experience some pain so I can get their attention. Not because God enjoys us going through pain. But if you sow to your base nature, that's what you're going to reap. If you don't like your life, nor what you are reaping, you might want to stop and think about what you're sowing into your body and into your mind and into your life. 
I meet believers all the time that barely crack open their Bible. You want to talk about good seed? This is full of good seed. Good seed. And the funny thing about the Bible, you can read the same principle or law 50 times and get 50 different things about it. So you can't just assume, well, I've got the whole Bible memorized, which I don't even have close to the whole Bible memorized. That doesn't matter. Read it again, and God will give you more revelation. Think about it again. Pray about it again. Pray through it again, and God will give you more revelation. This is full of good seed. And I know some young people get sick of that. They come, they come with a problem, and sometimes my response is, read your Bible. Adults are the same way. They come for counseling. Well, when's the last time that you've had devotions? When's the last time you read your Bible? I uh, can't, re- can't really remember the last time. I said, well, then go away and start reading your Bible and spend some time in prayer and then come back to me and, and, and we'll talk. You know, people wonder why, believers wonder why their lives are a mess. It's because they have not conformed their lives to the truths in this book. They're saved, but they don't know the truth. You have to know the truth in order for the truth to set you free. It doesn't automatically set you free. The truth has to be known and it has to be believed in order for it to set you free. If you begin to sow the positive life seeds, in a few months you'll begin to reap good things. That's the beauty of the Lord and that's grace. It's like if we decide, I'm done with this. I'm done acting like this, saying this, being involved in this. I'm done. Lord, I repent. Forgive me. Make things right. Lord, give me the strength to overcome this. He'll do it. He'll give you strength. He'll provide the way of escape. No one is tempted beyond what he can bear. God will always provide a way of escape. Now, sometimes you've ignored that way of escape so many times you don't see it anymore. Sometimes a way of escape might be a phone call from a friend. Sometimes the way of escape might be your car breaking down. You know, it could be these random things, but God will always provide a way of escape for a believer who's struggling. But if you don't take that way of escape, you ignore it multiple times, you won't see it anymore. And then that's a dangerous place to be. I have been there in my walk. It's a scary place to be. God will still try to break through. For me, he gave me a dream that petrified me. It was like I was actually there. i got to share the dream because it's weird. And you'll think it was just pizza, but it wasn't pizza. God gave me this dream to shake me up, and it shook me up so much that I just began to turn my life around. If you sow positive seeds, then you're going to have good fruit. Third principle is this. We reap, (coughs) excuse me, we reap more than we sow. Why do farmers plant their seed? Does a farmer plant one seed just thinking he's going to get one piece of fruit? No, a farmer plants a seed and he knows he's going to get more than what he planted. That's the cool thing about the law of sowing and reaping. You don't just reap the one seed that you sow. If you're generous to one person, that one person could talk about how generous you are. And the funny thing about somebody doing a good thing or like an act of kindness, it gets contagious wow, they did that. And then they start to feel convicted. Maybe I should do something. And then they start to do something. All because of that one seed that was sown. You know, this whole, God God spoke to me when we were putting together, it's hard to believe that God can speak to me when, when I'm in the middle of this financial process because there's nothing more frustrating than working on budgets and all this other stuff. Every year, we got to come up with budgets and, you know, we got to go to budget holders and budget owners and come up with a budget for the following year. And I'm telling you, it's painful. I don't like it. It's, it's miserable. You know, but as I'm, as I'm doing this and getting it, getting it back and messing things up again, I forgot this. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, there's, a, there's something missing. There's something missing from this process. And it, I know it was the Holy Spirit. He said, it's It's faith. You know, we got to be practical and we got to abide by a budget. We can't spend, spend money that we don't have. But when a church is putting together a budget, God wants us to dream. He wants us to have vision for the future. And he doesn't want us to just say, well, this is what we spent last year, so this is what we're going to spend this year. And I thought, we're not doing that this year. 
We're going to dream a little. And then we heard this word clearly spoken to us. And I believe, I believe the number is significant. Somebody spoke over, over this church and, and believed in 30% growth. And I don't know what they specifically meant. Maybe they just meant salvations. I'm taking it for everything. Is that cool with you? I want, I want you guys to be so impactful, so such good seed, that, that this community grows by 30%. We know how many people come. We're going to be talented at the beginning of the year. And I think it's important for us. These are some of the things that you can pray about while you're fasting. Lord, I'm believing this for, for my church community, and I'm believing it for me. And that's the cool thing about this. It applies to you as individuals in your household. I'm believing for 30% growth in your household, in your finances, that your family you're, that you've been praying for for years gets saved. I'm believing that for the congregation here. We reap <coughs> excuse me, more than we sow. A single seed that sprouts yields dozens, sometimes thousands. My father-in-law, I'm going to mess this up. Maybe you can help me with the accuracy of this. He's had tomato, uh, tomato seeds in his family for, do you know how many generations? I want to say at least three to four generations. I believe it's probably longer because I think the seeds came from Italy. I think. I could be wrong in that, but either way... It, you know, it, at, least, at least two or three generations, the same, the same seed passed down to different family members. How many tomatoes has that made? I mean, we benefited from some of those tomatoes. The marinara sauce from my father-in-law's tomato plants. It's like heaven. It's wonderful. But that one seed, maybe just a couple seeds that was passed down, made tomatoes after tomato after tomato, year after year after year year. It's compounding interest. It's ex exponential growth. Hosea 8, 7 says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. That could be a bad thing, but it could also be a good thing. Sowing means waiting. When a farmer sows a seed, it does not come up right away. Sometimes, for people like me, it takes a lot longer for it to sprout because I forget to water it or something like that. My wife is much better at it. She got really good at it when she brought the plants inside. <laughs> we have this, what do they call that? Little thing that's with the bubbling water that's really loud in the kitchen. We, we grow our herbs right in the kitchen. It's so cool. It's awesome. You can ask her how to do it. Anyhow, but sowing means waiting. Sometimes we reap later than what we sow. That is sowing good seed and bad seed. You know, sometimes we'll sow certain prayers about a thing. Maybe it's a physical healing. Maybe it's a financial breakthrough. Maybe it's a new job and it does not come right away. Well, the law of sowing and reaping is like that. Because God knows best. He knows exactly when to give you something and how to give it to you. He knows exactly what job you need. You know, so some, I, I, I just found out somebody that's in, in the midst of a transition it's actually an exciting thing. I didn't feel incredible disappointment. Well, maybe initially I did, you know, a little sadness, but we have somebody that's, that's in, involved helping, you know, form some structure around pastoral care. And, uh, you know, she found out that um, they're eliminating her position. But I believe God has something better, and so does she. You know, because she has sown good seed. She's a godly person. She loves the Lord. So, so because she sowed such good seed, God's got great plans for her. He's going to promote her somewhere. Hopefully here in Rochester, I want her to stay, <laughs> you know. But sometimes we have to wait. And the waiting does what? It builds character. We learn how to trust God. We learn how to walk with him. We learn how to be steadfast in our prayers and fervent in our prayers. It, it, it does. It develops character and develops, and we draw close to the Lord when we feel like everything else is falling apart. You know, it's the world we live in today. I don't know why, why everybody's not close to the Lord. You know, draw close to Him during those times and just trust that the good seed that is sown is going to bear fruit. Sowing and reaping <coughs> is a faith exercise. The other side of that coin is you sow bad seed. 
it is eventually going to catch up to you. I don't care whether you're a believer or a non-believer. Eventually, if you make a habit of sowing bad seed, involved in sinful activity, negative thinking, complaining all the time, arguing all the time, losing your temper all the time, those seeds will bear fruit that you're not going to like. But that's because it's a law. It is a spiritual law. There are two more principles. I'm going to get through these quickly. These come from uh, this passage in Mark 4. I don't think I'm going to read it all. You can start with verse 4 and work 1 through uh, 26 on your own time. I'm going to skip down to uh, verse 8. It says, but other seed, this is the, this is the parable of the soils and also, or the parable of the sower, but parable of the soils and, and also the parable of, of growing seed, which is towards the end of this chapter. But it says, but other seed fell on the ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, produced, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's exponential growth. That's multiplication, not addition. And he said to them, and in verse 13, do, not, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? This is where the Lord is saying, if you don't understand the law of sowing and reaping, you're not going to understand any other parable or any other principle or any other law. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones that are sown on stony, stony ground, who when they heard the word immediately received it with gladness and they had no, no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. You know, we often interpret, I mean, this parable does have to do with, you know, a, a word being sown and people getting saved or other people rejecting, but it has more to do than, than with just new believers. You have to, if, if, you read, if you read these other parables together, you'll, you'll understand that, God, that he's, he's trying to communicate a kingdom principle to them that applies more than just you sharing the gospel with somebody and whether they receive it or reject it. <clears throat> um, skipping down, skipping down. Verse 20. But these are the ones sown on the ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100 that word, that seed, that truth, that revelation, that prophecy has to be accepted in order for it to manifest in your life. I know people that have received prophecies that I really believe are words from the Lord that, are, that look so far from them and they, they don't believe it anymore. That can't happen to me. It can't happen to me because I'm like this or I'm there. Well, it's not going to happen. Why? Because they're not believing that truth. They're taking that seed, they're taking that truth that was sown in their life, that word, that truth, and choosing not to believe it. Therefore, that prophecy won't come true because they don't believe it. They're not walking in it. We have, to, we have to cultivate that word. We have to cultivate that truth, that revelation, that prophecy. Verse 26, this is the parable of the growing seed. The kingdom of God is as, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. He does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, the first, first the blade, then the head, after the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. These passages of Scripture talk about two things that I want to point out. One, exponential growth. Growth rates become more rapid in proportion to the growing total number of size. That's, that's just the nature of stuff. Seed, actual seed that's sown will, will, will yield a much bigger crop if something doesn't hinder it. You know that stuff hinders crops. Weeds, lack of attention, not watering, it's the same thing for your life. You can have good seed sown, you can have good truth sown in your life, and if you don't water it, you don't cultivate it, you don't choose to believe in it, you don't walk in it, you don't keep your life pure, you have stinking thinking, you won't yield the crop that God intended for you. So he expects exponential growth, rapid growth. That is a kingdom principle. He could give you a little, and that little, if you believe, can turn to a lot. God will give you everything that you need for life, everything that you need to live, and more. 
because he wants you to do something with it. And he loves giving good gifts to his kids. He wants us to live an abundant life. The other principle is this. This is the last one. The seed has power within itself. When, when the farmer plants that seed in the ground, yeah, he's got to water it. He had to prepare the soil. But could you imagine the farmer standing over that seed? Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. A little more water, nothing's happening. I'm going to dig it up. You, what happens when you dig up the seed? I've done that before. I planted a seed. I thought, somebody gave me blanks. These seeds, <laughs> these seeds aren't working. They're not sprouting. I dug this seed up, and wouldn't you know, it had a root, root system that start, was starting to develop, and I saw this little shoot out of the top of the seed, but it didn't come out of the soil because, to me, it was just taking too stinking long. But the seed has power in itself. This is, this is critical. Listen to this. Our words have the power of life and death, right? When a word leaves your mouth, you can't take it back. You can, you can apologize if it's a nasty word, if it's a good word. I hope it's a good word. It will still have, this, it will, it will have an effect. You know, but it has power within itself. It forms a life of its own. A belief system, a negative belief system, forms a life of its own. You don't have to think about your negative belief system. And I can tell you, it's taking root in your life, in the decisions that you're making. It causes hesitancy. When the Lord wants you to move ahead, and he knows there's that fear of moving ahead, he's going to start to whisper in your ear, something's going to happen. What are you going to submit to? You're going to submit to that fear because you haven't learned to walk confidently with the Lord. It's important, the seed that is sown. And understand, the seed that is sown, whether it's a good seed or a bad seed, grows all by itself. You don't have to nurture it. It will grow by itself because there's, there's another, another sower out in the world and that's the enemy of our souls. That's the father of lies. He will take those negative seeds in your life and trust me, he's going to water them. He's going to make them grow. He's going to fertilize them. He's going to find some way to spread that, spread a rumor about you, spread that word that you said, that thing that you've done. He's going to magnify that thing into, into something that was bigger than it really was because that's the way it works. There's two sowers in the spiritual realm. Well, there's a lot of them if you can continue or, or uh, include his minions, Satan's minions, but also God's angelic beings who are watchmen, who watch over us and protect us. But there are lots of things that are, that are at play, messing and manipulating those seeds. i tell you what, when I got a picture of this, I started to be really, really conscious about the seeds that I'm, I'm sowing. You know, particularly, as, particularly as, a, as a father and as a husband, you know, this should bring conviction and sobering to us all. But it also should bring some, some excitement. Because if you sow good seed, there's going to be exponential abundant growth with the good seed. You know, so we can, we can reverse things. We can, you know, so what? You had 15 years of making a mess of your life. In one year, people will forget about those 15 years. Because your friends are getting saved around you. Your family members are getting saved. People are getting healed left and right. Why? Because, because you took the seed of the truth of God's word. You're walking in intimacy with him and he just turns it around. He takes what the locusts have stolen and he gives it back to you. That's the God we serve. That's awesome. A good farmer sows the seed in faith, believing that all that has gone before in the preparation of the soil will bring forth a harvest. God wants us to prepare the soil. That's what it means to abide in him. It actually means to cultivate. It's a farming term abiding. If you want to abide in him, you know, you've, you've heard that term before, I'm, I'm abiding in the Lord. If you want to abide in him, then you have to work on the relationship you have with him. Spend time in the word and prayer, intimacy, fasting, doing what you have to do to grow in that intimacy and that trust in the Lord. What is the opposite of faith? Doubt. You sow seeds of faith or you sow seeds of doubt. One or the other. And we can sow either. And it will bear fruit. 
In conclusion, I just have a few questions. You can write these questions down. I'd like you to think about these as, we, as, you, as you get involved in the fast the next couple of weeks. If it is just about spending more time in the word, praying for Bethel as a community, the vision that he has for us, then I'd be happy with that. You don't have to take things out. Although anything that you take out I know is going to be a benefit. Write these questions down. I want you to at least write these down and ask these questions to yourself, but also, you know, as, think about this as a church community. What seeds are you sowing into your life in the lives of others? What seeds are you sowing into your life in the lives of others? What are your core beliefs or ways that you operate by? What are your core beliefs or ways that you operate by? What sort of fruit do you want to produce with your life? What sort of fruit do you want to produce with your life? If you didn't get those, <coughs> you can get, just come up to me after and I'll give them to you again. And I, I want you to pray about these. I want you to seek the Lord about these things. Don't, don't write answers to these right away. You know, Lord, if I'm not seeing something, show me. Or if some of these questions, you know, you immediately have an answer and think, I'm not doing anything. Then start to do something the next two weeks. All right? These seeds will grow and they'll grow exponentially. So I encourage you this week to participate in this fast for the next couple weeks. Pray for the Bethel community here. God has put us in a great family. I am privileged to serve under you guys. I'm your lead servant. I'm here to promote you, you know, to, to help you do well. Um, you know, so pray, pray for the leadership here. Um, pray for the vision that God has for us for 2017. Every year brings new challenges, but it also brings good things, new vision, new places that we're supposed to go. And believe in us, believe for us the, the, that 30%, 30% growth in every area. And we'll believe it for you also. Read these scriptures that are in this uh, printout. Laura always takes some prayerful time and, and put together these passages of scripture for us. I guarantee these will be specific direction for us in this season. Certainly sp specific direction for you the next 14 days. This is in your bulletin. If you didn't get one, you can get it in the back after the service. Um, I encourage you to, to do more. To do more. More maybe than that's in your mind. What I've learned about the Lord, the more that I invest in him, the more get, that gets invested or entrusted into me. Stretch yourself. It's good to live a life like that. And I think that's one of the things that you can get out of a, get out of a fast. You can learn how to stretch yourself a little bit, how to deny yourself. And I would expect that most of us in here can learn to do that a little bit more. You know, learning to deny yourself. I encourage you to do more, so stretch yourself. And make this more than just about you, okay? When I engage in this fast, even though I benefit from it, um, I know that this fast is certainly not just about me. It's about the people around me. It's about my relationships, my family. It's about the Bethel community. It's about the Rochester area. So very quickly, I stop asking, okay, Lord, what do you want to communicate to me? And I start asking, okay, Lord, how can I further your purposes in my family? and in my church, and in my community. So make it more than just about you. Make it about all those other things. Amen? All right, stand up. Let's pray. <clears throat> um, after I pray, uh, the worship team will be up here. Uh, the ministry team will be up here. If anybody needs prayer for healing, or you're just going through a frustrating period, or relationship issues, please come up, and the altar ministry team would love to pray with you. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, your truth that bears fruit in our lives. Lord, we, we, we benefit from that. We know that. We know that as believers. We know that when we got saved, there's so much that fell off, so much that went away. And that was because of your grace. And your grace continues to empower us to live that godly life. So Lord, even though there's nothing that separates us from your love, we know that we put things in our life that separate us from our intimate relationship with you, that make us dull of hearing, and dull of seeing. And we don't want that. So Lord, through your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would refine us, that you would convict us, that you would guide us, that you would give us re revelation, you'd give us wisdom so that we can be the victorious people
people, the victorious church that you have called us to be. A church that would rise up during this time and during this season of uncertainty to provide certainty, to provide hope, to provide love, to provide forgiveness. The world needs the church, even though that much of the, the world has rejected the church because sometimes the church has deserved the reputation they've got. But Lord, that's not your true church. Your church is full of love and forgiveness and hope. And Lord, that's what we want to be purveyors of in this place, in this Bethel community. So Lord, that we would be that. Every individual, every individual being a part of the body so that the members come together fitly joined together in unity with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you.